Hope you're excited this morning just to be here, ready to hear from whatever God has for us this morning. And so, um, just looking forward to getting into the Word today. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel. Um, pretty much every Sunday, you can bookmark for the next couple weeks, we are going to be in the book of Daniel. And uh, last week, we started a series titled Set Apart. And the basis of this series is around this idea of what happens when our calling, God has called every person in this room, not just those that are pastors. or uh, You have a calling on your life wherever God has placed you and equipped you. And so this series has been, what happens when our calling, the, the, whatever God has led us into, what happens when it meets the culture that is around us? Uh, there's a tension in that place. And so uh, we, we've been uh, talking about this idea. And God really led me to the book of Daniel. Um, because Daniel was in a foreign country in exile. And God had positioned him uh, with favor within the culture that did not value or have the same beliefs that he had. And I think a lot of times as the body of Christ, as Christians, uh, wherever you are on your faith journey, uh, we feel that tension. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you feel it a lot. Maybe you're really in the midst of it and you feel that tension of what God has called you to, the values God has placed in your life, the things that uh, he has equipped you with. And you feel the tension with the culture kind of fighting against those things. And so this series is about um, how God has called all of us to be set apart as his children. But how do you operate in the proximity that he has given you? Because the Bible says, Jesus said, we are strangers to this world. Uh, we are called to be different, yet we are also called to be present. And so that is an interesting tension in our lives. And so if you missed last week, I invite you to go back and listen to it because, uh, and, and it is important, and I don't say that just to get views or so that you would listen to me preach or whatever, but last week's sermon trickles through this whole entire series. So you need the understanding of what God has called you to so that you can understand how to operate within that. And so if you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 2 Verse 1 is where we're going to be. Last week we were in Daniel chapter 1. As you can see, we are chronologically moving through this story. But this is what it says. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. It says, One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Uh, he is in his second year of his kingship, uh, considered one of the most powerful world empires in history. And during his second year, he started to have dreams. You ever had dreams that torment you, that just keep you awake? That uh, uh, I remember as a kid, I used to have nightmares. I used to have dreams like panic attacks even in my dreams, like the room was closing in around me and I would wake up. Uh, I remember one time, like vividly, it's crazy the things you remember. I woke up, uh, and I'm not even scared of snakes now, but as a kid, snakes are terrifying, right? And I, I, I had this dream that like my room was filled with snakes and they were coming out of everything. And it did not matter any logic anyone would tell me. I believed there were snakes everywhere. Dreams are weird, they can hijack you. They can mess with you, uh, even, even on, on days on end. And this is Nebuchadnezzar in this moment. He is having dreams that are tormenting him because he doesn't understand what they mean. It says he called his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. We live in a time where we demand answers about a lot of things. And I was thinking about it this week uh, because I'm just old enough uh, to know what it was like to grow up without the internet. 
Some of you all understand that. Some of you don't understand that at all. You have literally grown up with the internet at your fingertips your entire life. But I'm just in that middle of the two generations where we didn't have computer labs as kids, but then by the time I got to high school, we had them, and it was like the coolest thing in the world. And uh, I started to think this week, what was it like? Because someone had asked me a question about something, and what's the first thing you do? You don't go to an an encyclopedia. You don't call someone up. Uh, You just go to Google, right? You just Google it. And, And I was telling someone, I'm like, people think I'm a lot smarter about stuff than I really am. I just know how to search the right places to find the answers. And I was thinking, like, what did we do before we had Google? Like, what did we do when we didn't know the answer to something or, or we didn't know what a plant was and you couldn't open an app and scan the plant, right? Or, or what did we do? But like, I remember, I've talked about this before, going to college for the first time and I didn't have a cell phone and I didn't have a GPS because uh, GPSs people don't even want now. You can find them at garage sales for like a dollar. But back in the day, a GPS cost like $400 to buy. And my parents were way too cheap to get me one of those. I think they just wanted to send me on a death mission to Florida by myself. But uh, <clears throat> I had a map. I would get in, and, and like people think we're distracted by phones. But like what people don't understand is. In my era, you had massive maps that you were trying to unfold as you were driving down the highway while pulling all of your CDs out and going through like big booklets of CDs. Like it was, it was a horrible system. And I was thinking about how, how did we find information back in the day? And what I, what I, as I thought about this, I thought, you know what? We just really didn't care. Isn't it interesting when you don't have a a source or you don't have someone to turn to? You just kind of let stuff go. And I was thinking about my childhood. Like, we never tried to figure out unless the teacher told us or something. Like, we weren't trying to figure everything out. Maybe you relate to that or maybe you don't. but, but, But I just think there was an era of time because we didn't have it, because you didn't have a cell phone sitting in your lap right now where you can ask it anything, you just let stuff go. And there are times in life where we need to search for clarity, we need to search for answers, and we need to understand things. Um, and, 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 and this is Nebuchadnezzar in this moment. He doesn't have Google to turn to. He doesn't, so, so he goes to what he thinks will give him the answer because it isn't something that he can just let go. It's something that, that the Bible says is tormenting him. And so he is searching for clarity. See, I think there's sometimes we need answers and we let things go and we move on. But there are other times where, where you just need to hunt down the answer. Anybody one of those people where, like, if you don't have the solution, it is going to obsess in your mind until you figure it out? You don't need to raise your hands. I know some of you and I know you are those people. That's okay. I am that person sometimes. Justin uh, was here when we first got the blinds and he was making fun of me because the blinds wouldn't open. And he's like, you aren't going to let that go. You're going to climb up there and try to fix it with everybody in the room and service starting. Because I'm that way sometimes. I need an answer of why something isn't working. This week, my, my daughter started watching Indiana Jones. Anybody love Indiana Jones? I'm so excited there's a new one. It probably will be horrible, but I hope not because Harrison Ford's in it, and he's a legend, and he's like, I think he's 87 now and still doing Indiana Jones movies. It's impressive. But I love Indiana Jones, and Kara watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I was like, there's like people's like faces that melt off at the end of that, and it's weird, but she was all in. She was, and she loved it. And, uh, and, and I love it, and she was like asking about the Ark of the Covenant, and what is it, and like, I'm like, actually, it's in the Bible. Let's, let's talk about it, but we don't really know, and it's kind of weird, but it's the presence of God, and, and it's all this stuff. But, but uh, what's interesting, I, I, I just run off, and my mind runs on things when she's talking. Like, we still don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. And actually, during the time of Daniel, it, when, when this story that we are in is taking place, that is when they believe the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. 
And no one seems to know what happened to it. So for, for centuries, people have been looking for the Ark of the Covenant. When I was a kid, I remember they thought they found it under Jerusalem somewhere. And they were like shooting infrared lasers like through walls. And they're like, it has to be there. But what's interesting is no one ever found out if it was there. So we still don't know where it is, yet we still continue to search because there is something in us that just needs answers. But sometimes there's things that just can't be explained. There are things that no matter how hard we search, no matter how hard we look, you just are not going to be able to find the answer. It is impossible. See, this is King Nebuchadnezzar in this moment when he has this dream. What he is searching for is impossible. What he is trying to understand within his human context and the people in his circle, it is impossible to find the answer. And I think so often because Nebuchadnezzar turns to his most trusted men, those things are left as impossible. And what we see in Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, if you want to get there, uh, he literally turns to his people. Our first reaction a lot of times is to turn to men or women or people in our lives. Because we think this person must know the answer. And this is never, he goes to his sorcerers and his astrologists and all these people that know what the stars are telling and whatever's happening. And, and this is what takes place. It says, the astrologers answer the king. Long live the king. Because you know when you show up to the king, you better praise him a little bit. Because if you don't have the right answer, that could be it. And so they begin to praise him because they're nervous about the request. They say, long live the king. Tell us the dream and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. I mean, this isn't a little thing. This is something that is wrecking his life because he doesn't understand. If you don't tell me what my dream was, And what it means, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned to heaps of rubble. He says, I don't want to tell you the dream because I don't want you to fake it. I need you to tell me what my dream was, and then give me the answer. This is an impossible request. Could you imagine if someone came to me, came to you, and they were like, I know something, and I need you to tell me what I know, and then tell me the answer about it, like the solution to it. You'd be like, Like, you are not giving me the information I need to help you. And this is the king in this moment. The the request is impossible for any person. And to make it worse, he says, if you give me the wrong answer, you're dead. I'm just going to rip you apart. Because I'm the king and I can do that. But he goes on, he says, if you tell me what, what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Because he's trying to, like, build them up. He's like, I'll kill you, but if you get it right, we're all good. You will live in the lap of luxury forever. He said, just tell me the dream and what it means. They said again, please, your majesty, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. The king replied, I know what you are doing. You're stalling for time because you know I am serious when I say if you don't tell me the dream, you are doomed. So you've conspired to tell me lies. You have have conspired because the request is too impossible. Hoping I will change my mind, but tell me the dream. It's like repetitive, right? Like, tell me the dream, and then... I know that you can tell me what it means. The the astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth, and this is what I want you to catch, they are at the impossible moment. There is no Google. There is no one to turn to. They have no answers. No one on earth can tell you, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. There's this back and forth, and it seems repetitive, but they're in this impossible moment. And the king is like, you, I'm not going to fall for it. I need a real answer. And they're like, we can't give you one. 
There's no solution to this. The king has turned to his trusted fortune tellers and he thinks it must be in the stars because that's the context. That's the culture that Babylon was. They worshiped the stars. They were, everything had a meaning. And I think about like all the things we turn to as humanity, even in this era of life. Everything has to have an answer, right? Culture is, is saying everything must give you a solution. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. Culture will tell you there has to be an explanation somewhere in the universe. There has to be a reason for everything. And not just there has to be a reason for everything, but we need to understand everything. Church, let me tell you this. If you are a person that feels like you have to understand everything or you do understand everything, what do you need a savior for? And we are being told as people this lie that we need to know everything. And if you know everything, you have no need for a God. And this is the, the same problem thousands of years ago that, that Nebuchadnezzar is facing. We are still wrestling with today as Christians in a culture that is searching for solutions to everything searching for all of knowledge. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to his people. And, and I just go back to this place. There are times in your life where you don't need to know everything. Do you know how freeing it is to get to the place where you just release the pursuit of knowledge? I'm not saying give up on seeking things out or understanding things, but there are times in life where you just need to give it to God and say, I don't need to understand why. I just need to trust you. Because if you don't, you will live a tormented life. And, and so this story is unfolding where, where the magicians say this is impossible. It can't happen. But Nebuchadnezzar cannot let it go. Nebuchadnezzar cannot release what is taking place. I want to go back to the story, Daniel chapter 2, verse 10. It says, the astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked anything of a magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. Even these pagan worshipers understand that, that there, are, there is a power above them that holds all the knowledge. And so they say, no one other than the gods can explain this to you. And it says, they go on, they say, and they do not live here among the people. They don't, they don't live here. It says the king was furious and he heard this and he ordered all the wise men of Babylon to be executed. Church, aren't you grateful that we serve a God that dwells amongst us? Like, I think we take it for granted. I think we take it for granted that we come into this house and we can worship. And it's not just us just singing empty songs, but literally the presence of God has been dwelling in this house since before you stepped through the door this morning. When you woke up this morning and you took your breath, your, your waking breath, you were breathing in the presence of God this morning. When you go out this afternoon, the presence of God dwells around you. It's not just in the church, but, but God's presence is all around us. And, and God pursues to be present with us. That's why he's not like Zeus sitting up in his like magical land looking down at humanity. He dwells amongst us. That's the beautiful thing of the Trinity and who God is, is that we have God the Father. We have the Son that literally came down as flesh and blood and walked amongst us. And, and not just that, we have the Spirit of God, his presence that dwells around and within us. These wise men, this king, they're perplexed because they say only the gods know, but they don't come around us. They, they, don't come, they don't come near us. They don't want to be amongst us. 
There is nothing we can do. It is impossible. But because God is so good, there is a solution to this problem. See, all the way back to last week, God had positioned Daniel as one of the king's wise men because he knew this moment was coming. He foresaw the opportunity for his glory to be shown, so he put Daniel in a position of favor. Daniel walked in his calling. That's what we talked about last week. Daniel was setting apart, set apart. He committed to the mission God had put him on. And, and not just committed and fought culture and said, I'm going to stand against everything and everyone's. No, he, he carefully positioned himself so that not only could he stand for holiness, but he could have favor amongst the people that didn't even believe what he believed. And so he was amongst them, and, and what we see in Jan, Daniel chapter 2, verse 13, is that favor come forth because he had positioned himself right. See, when you're walking in the call of God, when you are walking in his presence, when you are leaning in, when you are set apart, when you are pursuing his presence, God will position and equip you for the impossible. This is Daniel in this moment. We haven't even heard from Daniel yet. But Daniel was already positioned for what man said was impossible in this story. This is what we see, Daniel chapter 2, verse 13. And, and so the king sends out this decree. We're going to kill all the wise men. What we see in Daniel chapter 1 is that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had all been given the, the position of wise men because of the hand of God on their life. And so, according to that, they should be the ones murdered within this decree. It says, because of the king's de decree, men were sent out and find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation. I want you to catch this. Again, this goes back to last week's sermon. Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. I could preach a whole sermon just on that line. Because if you look at your life and the way you pursue things, would you say that your life is marked with wisdom and discretion? Because there's a big difference with wisdom and discretion allowing the Lord to speak than just passion and just running into it. It says Daniel was wise in this moment. He listened to God. He asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? And so the king's guard told him what had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king. He said, I don't have time for you. I'm going straight to the king. God had given Daniel favor with the king. And so he goes with, with, with boldness, he goes before the king. And he requests more time to tell the king what the dream meant. See, it said in Daniel chapter 1, God had given Daniel the gift to interpret dreams. Daniel knew he was equipped for the impossible. He was equipped for this moment. So it gave him a boldness to step into what looked impossible. So that God could be given the glory. And so he goes to the king and he says, give me more time. Let me think on this and pray on this and I will give you a solution. See, it all connects. We see God position Daniel for what is only possible through him. For this moment, there is a powerful moment taking in place in this story, and it is going to completely alter Nebuchadnezzar's life moving forward. It doesn't make sense for a Jewish boy to go before the most powerful man in the world. Remember, the Jews were exiled. They were slaves to Babylon. It does not make sense for this boy to, to rush before the most powerful man and, and not, not just say, could you please, but demand more time to find a solution. It does not make sense for him to go into this situation that seems impossible. But when God's hand in favor is on your situation, when you are facing mountains, church, catch this. God has the ability to move the impossible. When God's hand in favor, I didn't say when your abilities are good, when you're wise, when God's hand, when God's favor is on your situation, 
mountains that seem immovable are possible to be moved. I've seen it in my life. I was thinking about this, and I was sharing with uh, Gary and Becky this morning. There have been a lot of times in my life, I've done a lot of really cool things, I've seen a lot of things, and I was thinking about this this week, is that there have been a lot of cool moments in my life where I have found myself in situations that don't make sense, that, that seem really cool on the outside looking in. And there was a time in my 20s when I was younger that, that I used to find myself in these situations. And, and I remember trying to flaunt my own, like, abilities. Like, people would see, like, oh, Brent's at this place, or he's with this person, or he's doing this thing. And I remember literally in my, in my, in my youth, in my arrogance, trying to flaunt myself up to say, look how great I am. Look, look what I have done. Look how cool. Look, look at these people I know that I don't really know. But, but I would like to, to flaunt and puff up myself because it made me feel good. It made me feel like I had accomplished something. But as I've gotten older, and, and now that I have kids, like Logan's almost a teenager, and, and I got gray hair, and I'm not that cool anymore. And just ask my kids when we go to the father-daughter dance, and my daughter's like, Dad, you're embarrassing me. It's a very great way to humble yourself. But as I get older and I find myself in these situations, I, I don't have that same drive anymore. Because most of the time, it's because of other people. So I'm like, I, I should not be. I should not be this person. I should not be doing whatever I'm doing. It's only because of this person that I'm here. I found myself there this week. I was like, this doesn't make sense. It has nothing to do with me. Like how often in life does God do something for us? Does God give us the favor that we see of Daniel right here? And we very quickly make it all about us. Why do we see these pastors fall? Why, 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 are, why are one in six pastors committing suicide now? Why are religious leaders falling into temptation? Because God gives them blessing. And instead of giving the honor back to God, it becomes about them. And church, I want you to catch this because God is going to give you favor and position. He says it in his word. But if you don't give him the honor, if it becomes about you, God will remove his hand. And culture is going to tell you to puff up yourself. Culture is going to tell you, look how great you are. Look what you've accomplished. And I tell Noah and Colin and these young guys, like, if you don't have the hum humility to clean a toilet or change a light bulb, then you don't have the humility to stand on the pulpit. And that's a humbling place to sit in. But how often do we not want to do the serving or the unglorifying thing because it doesn't build us up? See, I believe Daniel finds the favor that he's in. Daniel finds the position that he's in because it's not about him. He knows the one that had given him the gift. He knows the one who had equipped him. He's not pretending to be mighty and powerful and wise. He knows that his wisdom only comes from one source, and that's from the Lord. And what we see in Scripture over and over again, whether it's Moses or David or even the apostles in the upper room, is that when they make it about them, destruction happens around them. Look at David. Look at what happens to David when, when his calling begins to serve himself with Bathsheba and he has, he has an illegitimate child with her. Literally everything falls apart in his life. Even his descendants down the line, you see dysfunction in his children with Absalom. And what happens in David's life is when, when he makes it about himself, destruction unfolds. But when he returns back to the foot of God, when he begins to honor God with his life, the favor is placed back on him. And Daniel is walking in this moment because Daniel knows how to get out of the way. This is what I want you to catch in this story. This is why this matters. This is why this, this passage, this story in the life of Daniel matters for you if you want to operate in culture, if you want to walk out your calling and yet still have favor and still let God use you in the culture you're in, is you have to understand something about the impossible. See, what is impossible for man is always possible for God. 
what I didn't say is what is impossible for man is impossible for you because of God. And that's what we tend to do. I said, what is impossible, man, is impossible for God. You are just a vessel to be used by the hand of God. You have to understand your position. Walking in our calling, moving in the impossible has nothing to do with you. It is all about bringing glory to God. And we have to remember this because I see so often in the church And when I say the church, I'm not talking about pastors and worship leaders. I'm talking about the church, all of us. Young people, listen to me. You are living in a culture that says, bring glory to yourself at any cost. Burn your friends. Burn your relationships. Quit jobs. uh, Become unreliable. As long as you're glorified, as long as you feel built up, as long as you feel good. And I'm not picking on young people, but the older generation didn't grow up with this. Like my grandparents, it was like, work your butt off and then maybe you'll feel good. And maybe one day you'll die and, and just maybe at the end you'll feel good about everything. But I'm concerned for our young people. I'm concerned for my children. I'm concerned for the church. Because culture is telling you that go and switch, move wherever you want, do whatever you have to do just so you can feel glorified. And we see Daniel as a young man not walking into the king's chamber looking for a reward, not looking for position. He doesn't go because Daniel doesn't even know the promise that was given to the astrologers where they would receive gifts and honor for answering the dream. Daniel doesn't know any of that. He just knows you're going to die because the king said so. And Daniel knows I have an answer, so I'm going to go. And a lot of times we want the glory, we want the honor. And, 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 and again, I'm not picking on young people, but I'm concerned because I'm, I'm seeing a generation grow up looking to serve themselves. Now I'm going to switch it as the older people in the room. We are allowing it to happen. We are allowing our young people, even our young Christians, We are not mentoring and teaching and equipping young people to be perseverant, to trust on the will of God, to lean into his presence, to not trust their own understandings, but to trust what he is leading them to. We are not serving our young people right in the church. God is not looking for a bride to glorify themselves. Culture has enough of that. Look at our politics. Look at, look at everything around us. It's all about what can I get. That's why, like, literally every month of the year is some sort of, like, pride month or uh, honor this month. Like, I can't even keep track of all the things that, like, what are we celebrating this week? Like, what is our desire to be put on a pedestal? Like, why do we desire it so much? Let me tell you, when you get the pedestal, it is not going to be as glorious as you think. Like, literally, I thought, I've been in ministry for almost 20 years now. And I thought, man, one day when I'm a lead pastor, it's going to be so great. And now that I'm a lead pastor, I'm like, I don't want to be a lead pastor. I just want to go work for someone. (laughs) Like, it is not that awesome. But we have this desire to serve ourselves. But what we see in Daniel is that he trusts God. And and what happens next in the story isn't isn't because of Daniel. is isn't because he's so great. It's because God is so great. We have to shift our thinking. We have to shift how we approach the world. We have to shift how we approach each other in our lives. What we see in Daniel chapter 2, verse 26, it says, The king said to Daniel, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. Daniel understands the mission. Daniel understands the task is impossible. But he says this, 
And I, and I love the humility of Daniel, and we could all learn something from even the way he communicates. Daniel is slow to speak. He moves carefully. He has great discernment. He leans on God. He says, there is no one who can answer this. It is, it is impossible. But he says this. He doesn't say, God has gifted me to answer you. He says, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. He answers him by saying, it's not me, it's God. God can do the impossible. And he says, now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. God gave Daniel for this moment. He set him apart for this moment. But Daniel has the humility to walk in his calling in the midst of culture and bring glory to God first. God under, Daniel understands that God is the only possible way to get through this. Church, some of y'all are facing situations in your life right now, and you've leaned on man. You've leaned on people. You've sought after them for the answers, and it has not made your situation better. You have tried to glorify yourself. You've tried to build yourself up. You thought, if I can rise and be great enough, if I can get this honor, if I can get this position, if I can have this job, if I can have this money, if I can have children, if I can have whatever it is, if I can have this relationship, it will solve my problems. I can build myself up enough to conquer the mountain in front of me. But the impossible isn't going to happen until your dependency turns to the Lord. And this is what we see in Daniel. He sets him apart, not out of Daniel's abilities, but because he's a good God. And he desires, see, this is what we forget in the church. He desires for the culture to know his goodness. And God is the same today. He desires for Sylvania to know how good he is. He desires for those that are lost and broken and hurting. He desires for, for those that are far from God, for those that are living in sin, for those that are doing all the wrong things. God has a deep desire for his children, his creation, to know how good he is. And a lot of times we want to fight culture. We just want to say, we're in the midst of pride month, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to talk about this, but, but it is what we're in. And we want to fight it and go against it and do all these things. But, but maybe God has positioned you in a way. Maybe God has called you for a time such as this to stand in the midst, to be the vessel of his goodness and his faithfulness. Maybe you are like Daniel. Daniel probably didn't want to go to the king. He knew the risk at hand. But if he didn't move, who would? We serve a God that can do the impossible. But if we don't believe it, we won't walk in it. And so Daniel steps out in faith. He says, God can answer it. He says this, Daniel chapter 2, verse 46. And I want to end with this. It says, then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel. Right before this in the passages between 28 and 46, Daniel explains the dream. I will be here all day if I read it and everything. Daniel explains the dream and what it's going to mean for Babylon and what is about to happen. It says, at that moment, a, God, a, a king that worshipped multiple gods. They were in a polygamy. They, they, they had, I almost said polygamous. <laughs> I mean, they were probably, yeah, polytheists. They were a polytheist culture. They were probably polygamists too, but uh, they worshiped many things. But a God, a king that just before was worshiping the stars, a, a young man with boldness goes before him and he brings forth truth with the favor of God. And it says the king threw himself down before Daniel and in the king's ignorance begins to worship Daniel. And he commands his people to offer sacrifices and burn incense. Nebuchadnezzar, because everything's a God, thinks Daniel is a God in this moment and says, we need to start worshiping him. 
And the king says to Daniel, truly, your God is the greatest of the gods. He hasn't. Like sometimes we, we think people need to move fast, but this is, a, this is a huge step for this king to just acknowledge God's power. He's not at the destination yet, but he's making movement. He says, truly your God is the greatest of the gods and the Lord of over all the kings, a revealer of mysteries. And for you have been able to reveal this secret. And what happens to Daniel? Because of his humility, God says, I'm going to set you apart more. I'm going to give you more favor within this culture. I'm going to, I'm going to give you more because I know you are faithful with what has been handed to you. Daniel's not chasing it, but it is given. It says, then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over all of Babylon. Like, do you understand how huge that is? As well of chief over all of his wise men. So now you have Daniel in this moment. You have Daniel in this story. You have Daniel in the midst of this culture. And because he is faithful with something small, because he is faithful in the moment God has put him in and not glorifying himself, well, now Daniel gets to step into a position over all the wise men. And what do you think he does with that? He's going to start to tell these people that are worshiping the stars who God really is how powerful he really is. Why was he able to give the answer when they weren't? Not only did he spare their life so they're going to love him, but now he's been given position with them. You want position? You want favor? Then put your faith in God. You want to have an impact on culture? Walk in humility. Be wise. Be careful. Listen to him. Do not serve yourself. But it starts with believing God is capable for the impossible. So here's my question, and I wanted to have some time of worship at the end of this so we could really wrestle with it. Where has God positioned you that you're putting your dependency on yourself? Where are you walking in your humanity when you should be walking in your humility? Where are you walking, glorifying yourself, thinking you can work through this situation when you got to realize you've only been given what you've been given because you serve a God that cares and loves you and believes in you and has equipped you? I love Peter in the New Testament. He's my, Peter might be my favorite character in the Bible. One, because he's a rebel. Two, because he wrestled with his calling. But three, we see when he receives the Holy Spirit, when he walks in the favor of God, he knows how broken he is. And in the book of Acts, he leads 3,000 people to Christ. And I imagine Peter walking out of that moment, like, I don't even know, like, how the heck did that just happen? Like, I don't deserve this. This is Daniel in this moment. And this, this alters the rest of the story. Even when he's in the lion's den at the end of his life, there's a humility that follows him because he knows it's really about God. And if God leaves him into the lion's den and he dies, he knows he trusted the will of God even into his death. But he also knows how great and powerful God is. Why is Daniel at peace in the lion's den? Because he knows he serves an impossible God. Why do Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're going to talk about that story coming up. Why do they have faith in the, why do they walk into a furnace, literally fire, and worship? Because they know they serve an impossible God. So what's in front of you that seems impossible? That only God said is possible. What do you need to put your faith in this morning? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are good. 
We thank you that you are mighty. We thank you that you are powerful. God, that nothing has been given to us. God, the breath that we breathe, what we took in this morning as we rose out of bed, the gift of another day is not something that we achieved, isn't something that we earned. It is a gift from you. And so the greatest thing we can do with the gift that you have given us today in every day, Lord, is bring honor to your name. Bring glory to your name. And so, God, I pray that we would acknowledge your position in our lives, your power in our lives. That we only have what is in our hands because you have given it to us. That is why we desire to be generous. Because none of it belongs to us anyway. God, even with my children, I pray that I would give them back to you because they're a gift from you. And so God, with the same humility, I pray we would approach what seems impossible in front of us. We would come before you and we would ask you to move. And God, that we would just move in a response to where you're leading. God, I pray for the impossible to happen in this room. The trials that people are facing, the mountains that are standing in their way. God, I pray if they would approach with a humility and a grace and a faith, God, I pray that mountains would be moved. God, I pray that healing would happen. I pray that uh, freedom, restoration would happen. God, I pray that families would be reunited. God, I pray that health issues that seem impossible for a solution, God, that there would be wholeness formed. And God, it would be an opportunity for us to bring honor to your name so that the culture that we are in the midst of would know the good news of the gospel and how truly good and mighty and powerful of a God we serve. So I I ask that you would reposition our hearts this morning. You would reposition our minds, our motives, so that we can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.